It's one thing I would say, Selena, is whatever success you have in your life, if you really look hard, you get an, a tremendous amount of support from others to get where you are. And you know, if you're if you're not sure what they are, then you got to think more about it. I received a lot of support along the way in my career, and a lot of people made things happen for me and stuck stuck up for me, stepped out for me, opened doors for me, mm-hmm. and that made me want to work hard um, and respect that people helped. Today, I am very excited as I have a very special guest, and that is Dion Kastiak. I'm very, very excited as we are related through marriage, and I don't know very much about him, but today we are both going to learn a lot about him as he has been an executive in his career and very high mentor, advisor, and leader in his industry. He also has retired early at 52, which I'm sure we're going to get to talk about, and has lived an extraordinary life, which we are going to dive in today. So welcome, Dion. Thanks, Selena. You're so uh, welcome. So we're going to get you to introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Selena. As Selena said, uh, I'm 52. I'm 53 now. And I retired in, in uh, I guess it would be in the new year. I'm uh, a dad. I've got um, three boys and lovely wife of uh, 20 years. Wow. And, yeah, uh, 20 years, and I have an Indigenous uh, and Ukrainian heritage, so I can definitely share more about that side of uh, me culturally. Mm-hmm. And just just a guy trying to stay in shape and enjoy life in my family. <laughs> That's awesome. And do you want to tell us a little bit more about your life growing up and the beginning stages of your life? Sure. So probably um, some of the high level things that might be um, relevant or interest is uh, my parents were entrepreneurs. So mm-hmm. at the youngest stage I can remember, I worked for my dad and our family business and tried to fit in friends and school around that. My dad was into cabinet making. So I spent a lot of my younger years learning how to use machinery and dealing with all parts of the business. Uh, and so that was that was interesting. I learned a lot of life skills at the same time. Didn't have as much opportunity to really dial into team sports or, you know, like I said, if I wanted to see my friends, they came to the shop as we called it and some worked with me and, and my family. And so it was late nights at the shop and my mom would bring us dinner, kind of like farming in a way mm-hmm. and we'd have dinner and then we would keep going. So I think uh, at a young age, <clears throat> I learned the value of hard work and building towards something And because of that, I didn't really focus a lot on school early on. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of later in life, um, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, where I wanted to do more schooling and I had to go back and make some changes and choices to really challenge myself with respect to education. So -hmm. that was a bit of a shift in my life to do that. And then from there, I, you know, we can talk about if if you want where things went with my career. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did spend a lot of time both with the family business and then, as I mentioned before, my Indigenous culture mm-hmm. um, with my mom and my dad learning about uh, about Indigenous culture and what that mean, meant to our family. Uh, family of five, I was the middle. Wow. So, older brother, older sister, and two younger sisters. Uh, so, yeah, family dinners, uh, lots of uh, battling for airtime. <laughs> And, uh, and for food, too. <laughs> With <laughs> my dad and, and my brother were always, you know, looking at who was going to get the last piece of, of whatever, chicken or steak. Um, so, yeah, a bit, pretty boisterous household, I would say. Yeah, I can relate to that. In my family, there's four of us, not as many as five, but it's always like, how, how can I get the most in and jump in and speak your voice while everybody else is talking at the same time? Um, so I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your culture and and how you grew up as an Indigenous man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think my mom um, probably exposed me along with my dad's Ukrainian, but my dad embraced the Native culture. Mm-hmm. And so we would... In my later teens, my dad and mom took me to some powwows and spent some time up in Fort St. John area with uh, the Blueberry and what well, was the Doig Band, the Blueberry and Doig Band, where I got to learn more about powwows and drumming. Um, my mom did a lot of the the bead work, um, and I was very fortunate to still have summer work. My mom passed away really young at 59, so that was. Yeah, big, big loss for our family, but certainly I get to look back on the things she taught me about the culture and giving back to other people, value of family, 
and tradition and really just being being environmentally responsible. Maybe I didn't understand it back then as much as I do now, certainly. And then as I said, my dad, he did all the fishing and hunting and smoking and sa- smoking salmon. And um, he was really into it as well. So I was really fortunate to be exposed from that side of it. In my career, <clears throat> early on in my career, I actually worked in a department called Native Affairs okay. for an oil and gas company. And so I was exposed from that side of it too, and what the business community was trying to do with addressing some of the challenges with Indigenous people uh, um, as it relates to the workforce. Mm-hmm. So I was very lucky to have it um, from different sides. One thing that stuck out for me, Selena, a lot when I was younger was when my mom passed away, They, uh, my dad actually arranged to have some um, healing drummers come to her wake. They were from mm-hmm. Siksika Reserve. And they <clears throat> they played a number of songs and, and sang, um, t- and it was meant to be towards healing. And that really stuck with me because it connected with me so strongly that I still walked out of my mom's wake with um, sadness, right? Because uh, yes. I lost my mom, but I didn't have grief. And that was an mm. incredible experience to walk away and not have be grief stricken. And it was very much connected to their drumming and, and how they healed me. And so that was, um, that was an aha for me. I didn't expect to have that happen to me. And that's when I really right. realized how important that culture is in my, my DNA, I guess you'd say. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I, when you speak of a loss, it's always very difficult, but it sounds very beautiful in the way that you explain it and how you experienced it. And you talked about how you don't, you didn't experience that grief. You still had sadness, but that grief was a little bit less maybe than the average. And so you say that it's because of the drumming. Is there anything else? And maybe explaining a little bit more about your experience through your mother's death and, and how old you were when that happened. Yeah. So, you know, I think I probably was, I probably was older than I think. <laughs> Maybe I was a small boy in my mind, but mm-hmm. I think I was probably, I'm going to guess and say in my thirties, but I, but I, I was pretty late bloomer, um, Selena, when it comes to uh, interpersonal and maturity. I was, yeah. uh, as a younger guy, I was pretty selfish in many respects, um, pretty judgmental. It took me quite, quite a while to figure out the value of of working on yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, so in some ways I was younger, I guess, um, right. but I felt it was in my thirties. Um, and I just saw how it affected um, our family. And there was something there for me when I walked away where the songs they sang, although I didn't speak their language, um, I understood what they were saying in their songs, which, yeah, it was really, it's really hard to describe it or explain it mm-hmm. to somebody. But I think for most people that were there that weren't Indigenous, they heard something that sounded the same over and over again, probably, and didn't know what it was, a bunch of people chanting or screaming. But for me, it, it was messaging. And it, and even though it wasn't in my language, I understood what they were saying. So pretty unique. I feel very mm-hmm. fortunate and have a lot of gratitude for having, um, having that experience. At the time, <clears throat> Ashton was... Our youngest son was, I think, four years old, three or four years old. And he sat on my knee uh, for probably 15 minutes while they drummed. And and that certainly um, caught my eye as well, because three and four year olds don't sit still for very long. Right. Yeah. And so it connected for him, too, as a young boy experiencing that. Uh, And I I just remember that stuck with me a long time. It's very, it's very, very powerful. And I thank you for being so open and honest and doing your best to explain what that experience like was for you. Because again, like you said, it's a very hard thing to explain to people because it's such an internal feeling that you were going through. And something that you did say and you acknowledge that um, you, which is really, really brave of you to acknowledge and recognize that maybe before in your 30s, you were not maybe uh, the kindest, most aware person. So I'd love to get into that a little bit and to explain what that means to you and how you kind of, what that journey was like for you to shift and change and alter. Sure. Yeah. It's, it was a big one in my life. Um, Funny enough, it it actually comes back to my mom, which I find interesting. Yeah. Somewhere in my, I want to say late twenties, I had had the opportunity to start playing sports with teams. I uh, didn't do a lot when I was younger. Right. 
And I remember being over at my mom and dad's house and my mom had put on a video and she had come to some of my baseball games and she had videotaped. And, uh, and I think my mom had an intention there to do what she did. Although I never had an opportunity to ask her about it, but I remember her putting on the video and it was of me and some of my teammates. And I remember seeing myself and I was gobsmacked by um, how I repre- how I showed up. Uh, the thing that struck me the most was that I wasn't very good. And, and I didn't know that. Uh, I think I thought I was pretty good. Right. And, <clears throat> but when I saw myself on video... And I was at least aware enough to see the difference between myself and other players on video and went, wow, I'm not very good. And that started me down. Yeah. So so it really got me to thinking around what else do I not know about the way I see myself versus the way others do. Right. And that started me down the journey of self-awareness. And of course, the more I thought about myself and the way that I showed up, the the more troubling it was, shall we say. Right. And it gets hard because the more you learn about yourself, the more you you become initially disappointed at things that you could do better or be better. And But the good news is that I kept going down that journey of self-awareness and trying to understand where, where I was and where I wanted to be. And I'd say, Selena, the biggest thing I I take away still to this day is, you know, we're not perfect and it's a journey and you got to work on it. And there will be things that you're disappointed on how you show up and knowing you can't unknow them once you know kind of more about and you're honest with yourself about what you're like. Well, then you have the opportunity to work um, at changing that. And when your self-awareness grows, you have a better shot at um, getting better at that. And, And so... I'd like to think today Mm -hmm. that I'm a lot less judgmental, a lot less selfish, a better team player than I would have been in my mid twenties or or so. And, and it's a long journey. Uh, It does. It's hard to, you have to, for me, I had to trace back to my roots where some of those behaviors came from and why those things were important to me. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of work. (laughs) No, I agree. I think anything when you're in that self-development, so self-growth, self-aware, self-awareness, all of that, it's extreme amount of work. It's hard. It's not linear. Some days it's amazing and some days it's not. And I think that you're talking very much so of this roller coaster of what it is. And it's rewarding though. So even though it is hard and it's not easy to do, it's very rewarding. And I'm sure you could testify to it being very rewarding in external ways not even just in internal ways and I think that's something so beautiful in your messaging that you know it's not you're not perfect and and you were able to take a peek at how is how are other people observing me and how am I perceiving myself as well which is just beautiful Mm -hmm. yeah no thank you it's you're bang on it's hard work it's rewarding it never stops (laughs) some mountains are harder to climb than others and there's Mm -hmm. been a few I've taken a crack at and still haven't got to the top right um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's worth pursuing, but I got to believe for most people, it's a lot easier to look at others than to look at yourself. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. It's easier. It is easier to go outside than go inside because especially depending on where you're starting your growth journey, uh, for me being younger, there's less baggage I have to go through. But for somebody who is older starting their journey, there's a lot more baggage that you have to go through. And when you're unpacking everything, it gets so messy. And it's it's like, whoa, like what what is going on right now? Um, But when you can really essentially like wipe the fog off that mirror and look at yourself and see who you truly are, it it does benefit in a lot of ways. In my personal experience, I can speak from it that it, it is it is hard. And every day there's a little layer again on the mirror that I have to wipe off again and again, because as we grow and evolve as humans, there's just new things, new emotions that come up, but we're building, we're building our toolbox. We're building the coping skills that we have for things. And so it's all this, this beautiful journey. And I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about your entrepreneurship journey. Cause I'm very, very interested in that. Um, I would classify myself as an entrepreneur and I love hearing others journeys. And you said that when you were younger, 
you jumped right into the family business. So a couple questions. Were you the only child who jumped into it or did your siblings do it? And then also like, what, what were, what was it like for you as a young man to start in a business right away? Sure. So the first one I would say was um, not only myself that jumped in, my older brother was pretty uh, involved as well. And my sisters, they certainly contributed to the family business. I mean, we all lived it in different ways. Right. My brother was probably the most involved. I was quite involved until I was probably about 18. Uh, and absolutely, you learn some incredible skills at a young age. You know, I certainly like to tell people, well, especially younger people, that when I was 15 years old, I was working in Weyburn, Saskatchewan in the month of December, living in a hotel room, um, working probably 10 hour days by myself. Wow. And my um, my dad had arranged, right? So I had some some supervision, uh, and I and I'm at that point I'm dealing with customers and the public. I'm managing money, I'm managing my own time, wow. and I'm responsible for um, myself and my parents. There's no cell phones, and um, you know I think at that time I, my dad had arranged for me to have the month of December off from my high school that I was attending, so that I could work. So really different in that regard. Um, but I, I mean, hey, I learned some incredible skills at a young age for, you know, the fact that I probably was lacking in some areas. I certainly wasn't lacking by the time I was in my mid-20s for, um, for, for that side of things. What I would tell you that might shock you a little bit and I hope it doesn't take the wind out of your sails is I think I realized probably in my early 20s that I would work harder for somebody else than I would for myself. Really? So, yeah. And so that was an interesting realization to go, if I get up every day and I work really hard and, and somebody that's senior to me is pleased by my efforts, that was more motivating to me than getting up to, to achieve things for my own uh, benefit um, without really anybody else above me. Right. Yeah. And so that's what, <laughs> that's what steered me away from entrepreneurialism really? um, yeah. because I, yeah, I didn't have that passion and fire and desire that I know is it must be there to be really successful as an entrepreneur. Right. I didn't have that, but I definitely had it if I was working for somebody else. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's all, all on your own journey and figuring that out at, you know, in your twenties is very helpful because instead of going down a completely different path, you knew I'm going to be more successful in this route. And so share a little bit more about that as well. How did you end up getting into being an executive in big companies and all that? Sure. So I started when I stopped working for my dad's business, I worked for another manufacturing company for probably about a year and a half. And you know, the story I would share is that I remember working in this business and I had skills with small machinery, woodworking tools, and I was working in a big manufacturing company making um, office furniture. So a lot of equipment and thousands of employees. And I remember one day sitting there feeding pieces of equipment through a you know, piece of wood through machinery, and I'm looking around and I just don't feel like I like I fit in. I don't feel like it's the place where I should be. My brain really wanted to do a lot more than just feed these pieces through the machine. Right. And so I started feeling like it wasn't in the right place. Like uh, this wasn't for me. And I think I resigned probably that day. Wow. So I didn't. Yeah, I think I did. And I didn't have, I mean, there were some other things that led up to it, but the important part of the story is that I didn't feel like it was the right place for me. I wanted to use my um, head more in a different way cognitively. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I decided I was going to go back to school because I didn't have a business degree. And so I resigned from my job. I went to, at the time, my oldest sister, her name is Rhonda, and asked her if I could live with her in her basement uh, while I go to school. And she said yes. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, at the time, I had a motorcycle, a little red Chevette, <laughs> 1984 red Chevette, and um, and I had my own apartment. And so I gave up my apartment. I sold my motorcycle and kept my little red Chevette and uh, lived in my sister's basement while I went to school for. And at that time, you could actually resign from a job. And if you went back to school, you would get employment insurance. You can no longer. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. Very lucky that I could. And I did. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me going down the 
continuing education side of the track where I started in the academia, learning more about that side of the world. And then coming out of that, um, out of that education, my first job, I remember I, I was looking for the job. And this might be helpful for younger people in their careers is wasn't sure what the job was, but what the job I ended up with definitely wasn't what I thought the job was. And it came from at the time my um, my ex-wife's mother had said, why don't you just sign up at one of these temporary agencies and you'll get you know a job started out of it somehow. So I, I pacified her. I signed up at one of these agencies yeah. and then they called me. So we have this job for you starts at, at the time, I think it was probably seven or $8 an hour. Um, yes. So don't, yeah, don't panic if you hear that number. Cause that was a lot of years ago, probably 30 yeah. <laughs> years ago. And, and I showed up and it was a big publicly traded oil and gas company. And I was in the mail room. So my first, and I didn't know what the job was at the time, but I showed up, it was temporary, had a young fellow that had just graduated from university and he was my boss and I sorted mail. That was my job for this big company with 50 floors. And that's where I started my career in the office was I started in the mail room. Wow. Wow. Right. And uh, thank goodness that I took that a little bit of advice from, uh, from Judy, her name was, because that actually led to where I started. So you don't always know when you, when you're going down a journey where the right path is, but definitely when people are supporting you and giving you ideas, sometimes they're worth pursuing because mm. you don't know where, what the next, corner or turn holds but anyway that's what got me going and then from in that mailroom job it turned into a permanent job and then I transferred there into um, a native affairs which was the job I referred to earlier mm -hmm. and then ultimately from there I ended up in human resources and that's where I built my career from there for the last 25 years was through human resources and I went back to school Selena Oh my gosh I probably never stopped going to school throughout that 25 years I was yeah. always yeah, I was always going to night school or to uh, certification um, courses to gain the newer knowledge that's required in my career as my um, responsibility grew. Mm -hmm. So yeah, pretty wild, <laughs> pretty wild yeah. start. Oh, I have so many questions. Okay, where do I start? So let's start with what did you originally graduate from university with? Like what was the degree or the diploma? What was that? So it was a diploma program. It, it might have even been a cert certification program. I, it was one or the other. It was at the time at a, at a school called Henderson's Business College. So it was okay. it was a business school that was designed for people that didn't have um, business degrees or they were adults who um, hadn't gone on to university. So mm -hmm. funny enough, I took typing, <laughs> yeah. I took, which has benefited me incredibly for, for people that aren't into uh and typing skills they're so valuable especially now where everything's done on computers yeah the typing i took microcomputers and i took accounting now microcomputers at the time if you can imagine this was in the 90s early early 90s there was no internet um there was there wasn't really laptops most of the corporations had central computers in departments and they had communication software between departments the internet was just coming out and there was software like um, ACPAC was accounting word perfect. There was no word. It was called word perfect. Mm -hmm. And then there was access and ex which went on to become Excel. Right. So I took, so I took all those courses. So I was very lucky because even though I started in the mailroom, I had the benefit of this knowledge of basic computer skills when a lot of the generation before me hadn't been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I came out of the gates with some computer skills that turned out to be extremely valuable in the years to come. And then I just kept building on to it from there. Yeah. So, yeah, that, so that's, that's kind of how it started. And yeah, then, and, sorry, no, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, and then a lot of the education I took following the, that program was all around human resources. So I did okay. the university, uh, university of Calgary management in human resources program um, I did a diploma program through Boston College that was called Corporate Community Relations. And then much later in my career, I took some board certification around governance and compensation 
through um, McMaster, I believe it was. So never, never stopped. <laughs> no, and and there's a lot of things I really love about what you've said. So the first thing that you said was you really have to be open and be willing to start somewhere. Like a lot of the times, I think, especially now in this generation that I'm growing up in, we expect a lot and we expect to be right at the top right away. But in, in your story, which is a beautiful example of how you just have to start somewhere. And sometimes it's not exactly what you thought or what you wanted, but it's a starting point and it, it built this beautiful career for yourself. And the other thing that I'm hearing is that you stayed curious. You wanted to learn. You had a passion to learn. So I'm wondering, where was that driven from? Why did you want to learn? Why did you want to keep up to date? Because, again, you very well could have chose not to. Right. Yeah. Um, but you chose to. So where does that desire come from? I, I think two places. One is uh, I was always described as Curious George. You, we might not know who Curious George I, is. I do, I do. I watched them when I was little. The little monkey, right? Who was yes. always into everything. Yes. So I was a Curious George uh, for sure. And then I think my dad and my mom, especially my dad, he really inspired uh, me to strive for more. And to if you couldn't, if you didn't know how to do something, then research it, figure it out, um, become resourceful, find a way to get what it is that you're looking for versus sort of just go, well, I don't know. And uh, that's probably what drove me a lot of times to be interested in something. If I had to change the brakes in my car, uh, and we certainly didn't have a lot of money, so it wasn't a matter of just take it to the mechanic. So I would have to do the research, go to the auto wrecker. And my brother was very much the same way. So between the two of us, we were always you know, learning from each other on how, how do you do that? Of course, when the internet came along, then that's the whole new world of learning. I mean, so much easier to learn how to do things now with the internet than it was back then. But I think that's where it came from is my mom and dad and my natural Curious George nature. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love the way you explain it. And I think that it's so powerful in just being able to, you know, I don't know something, that's okay. How do I figure out how to learn it? And like you said, nowadays with the internet, we have all of the resources and more of what we could ever need to learn anything. We have Google, we have the most, like we can Google anything. And it's still surprising me how some people will just stay stuck. It, even though we have lots of resources, but in your case, you were like, no, I'm just going to learn and figure it out. And you said that had a lot to do with your mom and dad. So what specifically did they do to teach you that? Was it the way they spoke to you or did they lead by example? Yeah, I would say the definitely lead by example. I, I never can, I can't think of Selena an example where my mom or dad said, I don't know. And that was the end of it right. versus uh, leading by example to try and set a goal and then work towards achieving it. And when you run into roadblocks, you figure out how to do it. Some ex I, I have one thought in my head I wanted to share around mm -hmm. the younger person starting their career um, and, and how important some people feel it is when they're young to have that right job. You know, it's like, got to get off on the right foot. Otherwise, I'm not going to get where I'm trying to go. I would say two really important things. The first one is the analogy of a marathon versus a sprint. So a career is a marathon. A mm -hmm. job maybe might maybe is a sprint. I'm not sure. But if you look at a, a hundred yard dash versus a marathon, in a hundred yard dash, they get in starting blocks. And there's often false starts because everyone's trying to get the best start because it matters to win the race. In a marathon, they don't have starting blocks. And quite honestly, when the gun goes off and they start running, nobody's too fussed about how fast they take out off the gates and cross the starting line because it doesn't matter actually. What matters is the longer endurance of the run and then how you cope with the perseverance throughout the run. That's what matters more. So I often tell young people that your first job, it sounds going to sound harsh, but doesn't actually matter. You could start in the mailroom or you could start in a professional role. Um, and, and it probably wouldn't have mattered for me either. It's more about what you do with yourself along the way. Mm -hmm. And the second part I was going to share with you is, when I was younger, I wanted to go to football camp when I was around 16 years old. And my parents went, well, if you want to go, you know, here's your opportunity to put your resourcefulness to work. So my dad helped me get a job at the Calgary Stampede. And I worked 10 days. I remember scooping up uh, horse crap um, on 8th Avenue Mall. And it was not a glorious job by any stretch. And it was embarrassing at times. But I was willing to do it. I mean, you see your friends, right, walking down the midway and you're cleaning up horse crap 
but I did it because I wanted to get the earn the money so I could go to this football camp. And it was in Abbotsford, BC, which is about 12 hours from here. And so, you know, when I turned 16, I had that money. I signed myself up for that football camp. I made the money and I drove there wow. by myself. Yeah. And I ended up taking two friends with me too. That's parents. Um, at the time, parents were a lot more trusting. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they sent their two, two boys with me and the three of us, we drove to BC and I did the football camp. Uh, for five days and and then went on from there. But I share that story because I had to figure that out. I really wanted to go. And my parents weren't about to say, well, look, we'll just pay for it. I think us as parents today, we we like to enable a lot more perhaps than maybe our, you know, our parents did. Mm-hmm. And not enabling and saying, hey, you want to figure it out, I'll support you, but I'm not going to clear the way for you for everything. Right. That's where that resourcefulness starts to develop and come from. Yeah. No, I think that's a a beautiful example of that. And really, like, it shows that you really wanted something. And so you had to work for you had to put in the work, coordinate all the things to make it happen, which just again, more great skill sets to develop. And you talked about football. So you you weren't able to play sports as much when you were younger. But when you were older, you mentioned that you were playing in some leagues and everything, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So what what was that all about? And maybe some lessons that you learned from that experience as well. Sure. I played a football in high school uh, and then I played baseball probably until I was in my 30s. And then we had our boys. And so then I started coaching, which is a whole nother experience. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. But, but I think what I, again, I shared some of what I learned is what does it mean to be a teammate and, and that you're there for the team versus your own performance and how you know, how you think that you're, I mean, you're there to contribute for sure. Right. But the, mm-hmm. we were, we were playing sports where it mattered as much that you were building relationships and being out doing something together as it was about just the win or the loss. Mm-hmm. So it took me a while to learn that one, but when you start to figure it out, you're like, Hey, this is a good thing, right? You get outside, you're with some friends, you're all trying to accomplish a goal, which is to, you know, compete. And hopefully you win, but how you get there together and build those bonds, that's the part where I started to figure out that matters probably even more than the outcome of a game or a season. So, and then that just the development of yourself as a person, how you, that back to that, how you show up thing. It's easy when everything's going good and you're winning. It's much easier to be happy go lucky, but when maybe things don't go your way or you've had a bad day at work or whatever it might be, how you show up as a person that's your that's who you are as a teammate too Mm so yeah lots of learnings there um it's tough to be a good it's tough to be a good teammate it takes work and that applies to the job no different than it applies to some fun intramural you know social league i guess right probably yeah 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 um and in high school football, I would say that it's tough on, it's tough. You're trying to fit in and you want to do good. And you're very self-conscious at that age about how well you do. And mm-hmm. I always tell the story about, I ran track a little bit in high school. And I remember in the city finals, I showed up there and, and I had sweatpants on and there's all these other guys from different schools there and then they take off their sweatpants and they got these running shorts on right and I'm going oh my god I don't have running shorts right now I feel like a bit of a fool because I'm now going to be running this 100 yard dash and I have sweatpants on these guys all have running shorts I've never felt more um out of place in my life that stuck with me like 40 years later 30 years later that moment and you know what it taught me was um you got to be prepared (laughs) you got to do your research and be prepared. And, and at the same time, it doesn't define you, right? It made me think a lot about what it feels like to not um, feel like you fit in. And so I think that my mom taught me this too, around how you can recognize that in other people and be a part of helping them feel like they fit in versus, um, you know, making them feel like they don't. So Yeah. yeah, I think I would see that pretty quickly if I was in those shoes and someone else and I would be doing what I could to make that person not feel so self-conscious. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just spectacular how we can see in your life, for example, how every moment is a building block to a better version of yourself, but also to who you become and what sticks with you and how it impacts you and what you can learn. I mean, I think we can learn from so much from each other, but also in our own stories of just constantly learning. And And I hear you talk and you're like, you didn't do something maybe 100% correct or you failed or, you know, failed or were misunderstood in some way but you weren't defeated by that you kept moving forward you kept going you kept showing up and doing your very best to do your best even more every single time which is just so inspiring like I just wanted to acknowledge that your story is very inspiring for me as a young person to hear all this is it's just absolutely inspiring and I think it's just it's it's fantastic yeah well I you know I would say that a lot of my best experiences came from failing or failing forward as people call it where yeah. You know, sometimes I knew I was going into danger, danger of embarrassment, and sometimes I didn't. But I will tell you that when I was um, probably in my late 20s, um, our, our oldest boy, he was in hockey and they needed a hockey coach. And I didn't, naturally, I didn't learn to skate when I was young because we were busy working. Mm-hmm. And so I probably could skate a very little bit, but enough that I thought I can get out there and kind of pretend a bit. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll coach, right? And there's three coaches with three different teams on the ice because they're all little guys. And I remember I had a Tim Hortons coffee in my hand and I'm standing along the boards and my skates and I fell. This is like coffee goes flying everywhere on the ice and yeah. there's all these parents right watching. And I felt really, really embarrassed at the time because I, because, you know, you feel like, hey, you should know how to skate really good and you should be the, at the same time, um, I went, you know what, I had the courage to step up and do the job. And it didn't deter me from, I didn't run away from it. I didn't go, I'm embarrassed. I'm out of here. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not never doing that again. I certainly measure my risk sometimes, but I know from that came a passion to coach. I learned to skate a little bit better uh, from that, but I also learned if you don't take a chance, you will never be embarrassed. And the example I would use for people is probably 10 years ago, there was a lady who came on to sing the national anthem on a hockey night in Canada and she forgot the words halfway through and she was embarrassed. She ran off and then people kind of encouraged her to come back on and finish. But nobody that's seen that, um, that video can remember her name. And it's because it's way, way more embarrassing for the person themselves than it is. I'm the only one probably that remembers that deeply, that experience of falling on the ice with that Tim Hortons coffee all over the place. Most people wouldn't remember it as dramatically as I do. Right. So that's something for people to remember is when you're embarrassed and you're taking a risk and you feel like you're out of place, it's way worse for you than than you think it is for everybody else that's watching you. And that's okay, right? Yeah. yeah. No, that's so important. And and you also mentioned about like pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. It's better to embarrass yourself than not. You know, at least you could say that you did it, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of you holding yourself back because you're so fearful of what people think or what happens. And I think that blocks a lot of people in everyday life from, you know, just simply living their lives because everyone's so afraid, like, ah, oh, what is everyone else going to think? Yeah, 100%. That's what it, that's bang on. Yeah. Uh, oh, this has been so amazing. And I also wanted to get in a little bit about your relationship. So you said you've been 20 or sorry, you've been married for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, congratulations for that. That is a huge, like, that's something to celebrate for sure. But yeah. I am like a hopeless romantic. I love love. And so I want to hear mm-hmm. your story, your journey, and then also your kids and how you've been shaping the young minds of your kids. Oh boy. Um, so I've, so I'm actually, I've been married twice. <laughs> so okay. I was married in my early twenties uh, for about eight years. And then I've been married um, now for 20 years with Jennifer. Yeah. I think you know Jennifer. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and we have uh, Ashton and, and in my first marriage, I had um, Christian and Keegan. And I'm not sure if, if you know this or ever shared it, but we lost our middle son Keegan when he was 18 to fentanyl so that could be a whole nother podcast around mm-hmm. what um you know what risk there is for young people and and that would have had a, a huge impact in our life at the time which was probably about seven or eight years ago now i'm just roughly in my head right. so i've kind of had this pretty interesting full packed you know 30 some odd years where i've had 
a marriage with two boys and we lost one. And then Jennifer and I have had Ashton and of course, and Christian and Keegan have been very much part of our family and, and is our family throughout the last 20 years. Um, and boy, I feel nothing but gratitude um, to have, mm-hmm. you know, um, a wife like Jennifer, right? Uh, you yeah. know her. She's, you know, pretty much as good as you could ask for a, a significant other to spend your life with. Yeah. And every, yeah. every day I feel very lucky. Lots of hard work for us, right? As a couple, I will tell people, even a hopeless romantic, that there's a lot of work in there. And probably the more you work on your side of the relationship, the better it'll be. Yes, I've heard that. So, yeah, you got to work on your your piece and the other person will work on their piece and you can just get better. Mm-hmm. It really leads to some pretty awesome um, things that you can do together and enjoy together. But raising kids is hard. Yes. And, oh, yeah. So every skill that you that you don't have, kids will help you develop <laughs> or you'll be a bad parent. So, you know, if you don't have patience, you're going to learn patience as you raise your kids. They teach you so much. Mm-hmm. And and for those that have the opportunity to have children, I mean, it's an amazing experience watching them grow and develop and go through struggles that some you can relate to and some you can't. Mm-hmm. And just how, how to be a good dad, uh, you know, is it's hard work too. Lots of messages of hard work, mm-hmm. but it's rewarding, right? It's yes, rewarding. Yeah. This year I got to play baseball with our oldest son, Christian, and our youngest son, Ashton, on the same baseball diamond with both of the boys. And that's pretty special. That's pretty yeah. cool. And Jennifer, you know, sitting in the stands, cheering us on and watching. So, yeah, we're at the stage in our life where we get to now plan the things that we want to do for travel. Mm-hmm. And yeah. time together as Ashton gets closer to college and it's a whole new world for us. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I feel lucky, Selena, to yeah. have a relationship where you can spend your life with somebody that's your best friend that, you know, every day you get to talk about things you want to do and the struggles and the good stuff. and yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way that you explain and talk about your family, I can feel the love that you have for all of them. It just shines through everything you say. And I know you mentioned that you said you lost a son. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it could be a whole nother conversation. But would you like to share anything about that or anything about that? As it it is a very impactful thing that can happen to someone. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, probably most people couldn't relate because it's really hard uh, to go through. I feel very fortunate that I had the career that I did and Jen had in HR because it prepared me probably a lot better than most people would be prepared to deal with something like that. Um, Our work and my work and our work and family and friends were exceptional in how they supported us because it's a pretty tough thing to deal with. Yeah. <clears throat> to go through and yeah it makes you it makes you think about maybe a good message for everyone is you know if you're frustrated with your kids you know I feel very lucky that I that my last time that I spent with Keegan I you know I wasn't mad at him I made sure I told him I loved him which you know I I know you're that it's important to do that but it really is because you never know right in my case um, I didn't know but I'm very um, I have a lot of gratitude for the fact that I didn't have a sour note with him in the last days that I had with him. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, and I feel, um, I feel almost guilty for that in some ways, because I think it would be really tough to, if you had, um, had a bit of a fight or something before that would be really hard to live with. So um, tough to go through. I think a lot about him and some, sometimes I used to watch his videos a lot. Now I don't as much because it's harder to watch him now than it was a few, quite a few years ago. But uh, he was an exceptional young man. He was a redhead, and he was the the really unique Auburn red hair that you that's you don't see very often. Mm-hmm. You know, he had to do with some of the stuff that the younger people do nowadays. They apparently they had a kick a ginger day in school, which sometimes I don't understand young people's motivations <clears throat> behind stuff like that. So it would be tougher on him. He was really musical, fun loving. He was a great athlete. And who knows where he would have went um, with things in his life. And so we still honor him. And, of course. and we, yeah, and we and I do a lot of things in my mind, in memory of him. I run a lot. And uh, when I run, I feel like I'm, you know, with him when I run. So I love running. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, and my my like I said, my work was so amazing and supporting us. I just I, I remember that about the funeral 
like it was yesterday, all the people that supported us. So when you're thinking about, you know, going to a funeral and it's a bit of a downer, the support you bring to someone is healing and it's pretty powerful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it's it's challenging and not everybody will know what it's like to lose a child because, you know, it's it's not supposed to be that way. But it is definitely a blessing that you ended on good terms the last time you spoke with your son. Um, And there's a whole we could dive a lot into everything, but we're we're going to keep moving along. But I I appreciate you opening up and sharing that as honoring him is very important to you and speaking about him and connecting to through him through running is just it's it's inspiring to hear again and uplifting that there's hope and that even though sometimes somebody's life comes to an end there is well maybe a little bit sooner than you would hope there is still some beautiful things that can come from that of course Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, you got it all right so before we start to wrap up, I do four final questions, but I wanted you to give the I wanted to give you the opportunity to share anything else about you or where you are now, what exciting things you have coming up. Yeah, holy moly. So I always wanted to learn to play piano. <clears throat> and when you say these things in your life, better be prepared to live up to them. Because if you get the opportunity, then you then you know you gotta you gotta see how honest you are with yourself. So I've always said I wanted to learn piano. So now I'm taking piano lessons awesome. <laughs> and I will tell you, it's hard. It's mm-hmm. a, I knew it would be hard, but it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. I'm blessed to have a former coworker who's a uh, Royal Conservatory piano teacher. And she wow. is lovely and has been teaching me like a young child that I am in <laughs> piano. So that's kind of fun, right? So like learning mm-hmm. all over again with something different. Yeah. I love guitar. I play guitar almost every day and sing. Um, I love golf. Golf is a torturous um, leisure sport, but a lot of life learning comes in golf. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm loving learning and ex- learning about myself through that game. And then, yeah, spending time traveling with Jen. Uh, we we go to movies um, at least once a week, sometimes awesome. twice. <laughs> There's not enough movies out for, we just love going to the movie theater and getting popcorn and watching movies. Yeah. Well, that's some of the stuff I'm doing and going to the gym. I now have time to go to the gym and not feel rushed. And I I love it because it represents for me being healthier, which means we can go do all this travel and the fun stuff mm-hmm. we want to do. So, yeah. So I think that that sort of stuck out for me to share with you. Yeah. And then I was thinking a little bit about I was thinking about life theme stuff, but I probably will hold off on sharing that because you might ask me in some of your questions. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just really quickly, one thing we didn't touch on was how you retired um, early. And so I'd love to go over that before we get to those questions as well, because I think it's, it's an interesting concept retirement in itself. So I'd love for you to, to hear your experience. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm at the early stages. I, I chose to retire because I felt at the time, like, I wanted to be more focused on fitness and wellness. I didn't want to end up in a spot where uh, I was retiring because I wasn't healthy and Mm. and I wasn't feeling as healthy as I feel like I should be and works. I had a pretty big job, a lot of responsibility and and it was a great job and a wonderful company that I worked for, very supportive. But there was inside of me, there was a feeling of I want to feel healthier and both mentally and physically. And I feel like if I retire, I'm going to have the opportunity to focus on that. And that was really important to me. Then there was the part around being able to spend time with Jen, going to places and seeing things that we might not be able to do later in life if we're not mm. physically able to. So I didn't want to leave that to chance. And and we were fortunate enough to do well enough in our careers that we were afforded the opportunity to retire early. So all of that sort of led me to do it. I will tell you, it was probably the hardest decision, top three for sure in my life around doing because you feel like you're quitting on right. people. Yeah, you feel like you're walking away and quitting on people. And that's not a very good feeling no. at all. Um, but people always give you great advice and say, you got to look out for yourself and your family. And that's true. And so I took that to heart. And uh, and I just I went for it. My gut tell me to do it and you should always listen to your gut yeah. so I, I did it and it's early stages now and there's lots to learn from it but I'm really excited and happy to you know what comes in store next week and next month mm-hmm. yeah 
Yeah, that's fantastic. And I and I love your view on it because a lot of the times I like think when I think of retirement, you know, you think that you're going to be dead after and you're old. And I was actually, no, this is something so funny. So I was at this uh, leadership training this last weekend and this lady stands up and she says, well, I'm retired. And he's like, okay, great, but you're not dead. And I think that a lot of people have this like view that like when they're going to retire, you know, their life is going to be over. But really, every single day you get to choose what your life is going to look like. And what I hear when you speak is that you've chosen to take this next step and take care of yourself more so you can do more things and have more adventures in a different way. Yeah. And I would say the whole idea of, oh, you're retired and you're dead. That probably comes from, you know, back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. That was kind of what happened is you retired mm. at 65 and you're lucky to live past your 70s. And so people's life expectancy is a lot longer now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it is hard to manage yourself financially. But I know there are some people where they'll never feel like they have enough money. Right. And so there's a point when you have to just go, hey, live within your means. And if you can do it awesome and good for you and if you, if you can't do it then try to um, enjoy your life as you go I mean we could have a whole podcast on the mm -hmm. financial financial side of the equation um, but it takes a lot of discipline to get to a place yeah. where where you can enjoy life along the way and then enjoy it without necessarily having to work every day too at some point Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know what, I might have to get you to come back and talk about that financial stuff, because it is it is a big topic that is so important to talk about that I don't think is talked about enough. I would um, love to. I okay, well, uh, we'll hook up something to do with that. We'll maybe do another one uh, in the thank next you. season about finance. But I, again, I just wanted to thank you so much for being so vulnerable and open because that takes an extreme amount of courage. And I hope that you know that you've inspired me today, but you're also going to inspire everyone who listens to this episode because your life has just been so amazing and you've been able to learn so many things and see the blessings and be grateful for the hard times. And so I just wanted to thank you again because it's just phenomenal you're welcome all yeah. right so the final four questions yeah, and if if they don't like if you still have some things to say after it that don't align with what you were kind of thinking let me know because i want to hear everything you have you <laughs> so it. the first you know. question is what is the best advice you've ever received what is the best advice i've ever received gosh i've received so much good advice um, I think, you know, work hard and um, work hard and and good things happen to good people, I think is probably some of the advice. When I think about good things happen to good people, it really means, you know, do do your share, do your part, work hard, be a good person and good things will come your way. And they do. Yeah, um, they do. So, gosh, I received so much good advice. But I think that one sticks out for me. Work, work hard is a good one. There's yeah. nothing that can ever you know, come that uh, bad from working hard. It's just, it's brought a lot of wonderful things to my world and mm -hmm. I feel good about it too. But yeah, work hard. Good things happen to good people. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Those are two phenomenal answers. All right, the next one. What is the worst advice you've received? The worst advice I've received? Um, gosh, maybe I'll have a hard time with it because I try not to listen to it if I think. Yeah, I was going to say, so this question is often tricky because, you know, you pick what you need and you disregard what you don't need. But maybe instead of the worst advice, what is something maybe that, you know, that society believes that maybe you don't align with quite, you know, like something like that? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think what, you know, government's a good one because everybody likes to take shots at the government, and particularly right now. <laughs> we won't say who, but we know who. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think as you grow and you mature, you realize it's a complicated world and we all represent the things that are important to us. But at the end of the day, it's hard to run a country. It's hard to run a province, hard to run a city. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people that, and I do it too, but people that take shots at the system right and say you know that you know taxes and this and that and i go yeah i know it's hard and we've got things we got to get better at as a country but we're pretty lucky yes. right we live in a country that for now at least appears to be pretty safe and you can say what you you're thinking for the most part and you have opportunity and you have a healthcare system mm -hmm. and um, you know a lot of um, freedoms and values that maybe you couldn't have in other places i mean that's pretty darn good uh, mm -hmm. to me so being being 
um, appreciative of that versus people's advice where, you know, they're more critical, I guess, of that. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm guilty of it too, but I try to, I try to myself. I mean, I think in, in general, it's just being gracious with the people in the roles that they're in, because sometimes it can appear that it should be something easy, but it's a lot more difficult. So, you know, leading with graciousness and then also having that gratitude that, you know, us in this country, in Canada, we are very fortunate and it's not perfect because that's not what we're saying, but we're very fortunate for sure. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely like that answer. All yeah. right. Next one. What is a piece of advice you would tell your younger self? or somebody in the younger generation? Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> my younger self, I probably would say, you know, get in, get back into school as early as you can or, you know, or work harder. In, I didn't focus on school as much when I was younger, but it was not because I didn't care about it. It was just be, between the family business and everything else. It didn't have the same prioritization, mm -hmm. but I would say school matters a lot. And education matters a lot. You never stop learning. That would be for me. For a younger, for a younger generation, um, I would say, you know, the older generation uh, has a lot more in common with the younger generation than they might think. Mm -hmm. And and working, um, building our relationships together on the things that we have that are similarities is far more valuable than um, picking apart the differences in each other. And Mm -hmm. And it, it always bothered me in my career, Selena, when we would do these seminars on stereotyping the generations, right? Like the millennials or echo boomers, whatever they call, you know, they're entitled and they have these behaviors. And I'm sure the younger generation would be like, those old guys don't know the future. And they're, yeah, we're lazy, whatever else uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> social, social media literate and yeah. the list goes on. But what I learned over my time is that <clears throat> we have way more in common, um, young people and people that are later in life. Mm -hmm. And and we should embrace that and we should we should celebrate that. Sometimes I'll see an older person at a wedding or somewhere and I just can't get enough of sitting down and talking to them because they have all this life experience and then people just leave them in the corner and they don't talk to them. Yeah. And, yeah, and I, I go, if I'm a younger person, my advice to a young person is, talk to those people that have had life experiences much like you're doing mm -hmm. and, and gain as much knowledge and experience and perspective as you can from them because it will bring you closer together and it'll also help you with your perspectives on the world because if you just listen to social media they you know to me they pit the generations against each other more than yeah. bring them together yeah I mean, there's so many beautiful things that you said in that. And it's it's so great. I love that we, you know, we're a lot more similar than we think. And sometimes we think I'm the only one who knows what this feels like, or I'm the only one going through this. But in reality, there's lots of people before us who have gone through hard things and are experience hard th experiencing really difficult things. And when we can come together and learn from each other. And again, like you said, this is why I have this podcast, because I believe that we can learn so much from each other. And sometimes when we're looking at social media, we're looking at someone who doesn't have maybe as much experience or and maybe they're still saying very valid things, but maybe they don't have the experience to back them up on it. Where if you take that opportunity, when you see somebody who is different than you, who is older mm -hmm. than you, any anything can classify. There's so much that we can learn from each other, no matter who or what or who you do, what you do, what you look like. We can just learn from each other. And I think that that's a beautiful piece of advice for younger people. Good. Awesome. Okay. So before we get into the last question, because I want to end on this last question, yeah, okay. was there anything that we missed that you wanted to share? Oh boy. Um, uh, value of family traditions. I think family, family needs to be um, front and center for people and family tradition matters so much as we go forward. We're so busy, so many competing priorities that having taking that time to do those family traditions, you know, the, the schmaltzes do the family dinners together. And I always look forward to that, you know, even when we're busy just to stay connected because we matter, we're family yeah. and uh, our family vacations. We do every other year we go to Victoria and it matters more and more as you get older, I guess I would say. So if you, if you ever been to a family reunion, it's usually the older people that are organizing it. But as you get older, then you start going, Hey, when's the next family reunion? Cause whereas the younger people, they show up there and they're like, all right, what do we got to do here? 
get through yeah. these days, right? So yeah. family, family matters a lot and, and uh, family traditions are, are really important and keep doing them. Yeah, it's I- important that we don't lose it because there's a lot like of things happening. And for my family, like we have family dinners almost every single night with how many of our people are here. We try to get them here, like within my own, like yeah. sibling and family. And I, and I saw friends who didn't have that who yeah. didn't have the parents that wanted to sit down and eat dinner with them. And even if you didn't say anything, just the fact that you're all sitting there, there together, you know, it's, it's a beautiful symbol of just kind of like knowing that they're going to be there and show up for you. And I think it's just a beautiful thing that we need to embrace a little bit more. Like you're saying, yeah. there's so it's important. Embrace it. So the other thing that hope we have time for this is I thought, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I had an experience probably six years ago where something I did something and what happened to me and my learning from it was totally different than what I thought. And so I'll share it quickly with you. And yes. then, the, and then the learning behind it. So my wife and I were sitting in a hamburger joint with our son Ashton. And we had read this article on this guy who was uh, diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer. And it's like a form of blood cancer. And he had, he was selling Christmas trees and he wanted to um, take his wife to Maui to renew their vows before his quality of life got too deteriorated because he knew that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And he was getting stem cell, uh, whatever it is, uh, implants or whatever they're doing. To... Anyway, so I read this and I was like, Jen, I, we could make this happen, right? We could do this. And so I sent a note out the next day to all of my closest friends and my coworkers and boss and what have you and said, this is the guy's story. I think it's about $10,000. I want to raise it, make this happen for this guy. Um, I'll run a marathon by the end of the summer if you donate money to this cause. Okay. So my motivation was that I wanted to make this happen for this guy because I thought it, that I could. And it, and it, I've read lots of stories about people that um, are need some help or whatever. And for whatever reason, that one spoke to me. So mm-hmm. I got all this money fast. Like within a week, I got 10 grand. Wow. Now, now, I didn't know what a marathon was. So sometimes I speak spontaneously without research. Uh, and then the resourcefulness comes in later. So, of course, I, you know, I Google a, a week later, what's what's the training for a marathon? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't know what a marathon was. I thought it was just kind of a long run. Right. Yeah, that's it's what I would assume. Run. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long run, right? It's 42.2 kilometers. Yeah. So I, so I read I had to do training for it. And the training was about a five month training program. Long story short, I trained for the marathon. I probably lost 20 pounds through the training. Wow. And I didn't know what I, in fact, I didn't like back to my judgmental side when I was younger. I didn't like runners. I was like, what are they doing? What's this wearing these tight pants and going out? <laughs> big yes. facade, right. And I never really understood it. So I was pretty judgy towards them. So now I'm the tight pants guy, right? Yeah. Running, running every day outside. And so I just was on a mission, right, to do this. So I trained, I ran the marathon, it was bloody hard. I got it done. I felt a lot of uh, gratitude towards finishing and accomplishment and achievement. But what happened after was, was probably what shocked me. And it was that now I still run. And so I ended up with this gift, right, of running mm-hmm. that I never, ever would have pursued on my own. And I never would have realized why people run that do like it and what you get from it. And it all came because this thing I saw and I read spoke to me and I jumped in and did it without a lot of, you know, the fierce. I didn't even think about fear. I just jumped in and said, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And then I did it. And after I was like, wow, I never would. I, I got the gift of running and the love of running from it. But that wasn't my goal when I started. Right. So, so I end up with this awesome thing right that mm-hmm. comes up just from doing something else and following something that speaks to you and I think that I share that story with you because you never know what's going to come out of something that you've got some interest or passion and so it's like get after it go do it and you'll be shocked at what you get in return for that not that you're looking for something in return but you'll right. be shocked at what comes of it I guess is what yeah. I'm saying yeah and it's being open to see what could come from that right because you just you never know it's going in with no expectations and just receiving whatever it is but that I mean that is a beautiful story and I I think it's so awesome that you saw something you believed in it and you were like okay everyone around me how can we make this happen I want to make this happen and so did you did they end up going on their trip and 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we end up celebrating um, by giving them the gift. Jen and I, incredible feeling in and of itself. And the gratitude yeah. that gentleman felt for someone that would do that that didn't know him was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And he did get to go to Maui and he didn't renew his vows with his wife, which is, again, it's cool. It's just uh, yeah. it's a cool life experience. <laughs> Yeah, what a gift. What a gift both of you received. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Is it you ready for the last question? Yeah. It's, it's a very easy one. Okay, ready? Yeah. What are you grateful for? Holy moly. What am I grateful for? I'm grateful that I live in a great country. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful to have a beautiful and amazing wife. I'm grateful for the kids that I have. I still call them kids, but they're adults. Yeah. The time that I get to spend with them. I'm grateful for the family and extended family that Jen and I have. I'm grateful to have parents that raise me with good values and the, the uh, importance of hard work. I'm grateful to have had a career where a lot of people helped me. It's one thing I would say, Selena, is whatever success you have in your life, if you really look hard, you get an, a tremendous amount of support from others to get where you are. And, you know, if you're, if you're not sure what they are, then you got to think more about it. I received a lot of support along the way in my career and a lot of people made things happen for me. It stuck, stuck up for me, stepped out for me, opened doors for me. Mm-hmm. And that made me want to work hard um, and respect that people helped me, but they did. And that's, mm-hmm. that, I wouldn't have got where I am without that. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my health. Yeah. Um, that's a lot uh, to be grateful for. I mean, there's a lot to be grateful for, right? <laughs> there is a lot. You're right. Yeah. yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, I love to end every interview in a state of gratitude because I feel that it is so important that we're grateful for what we have and everything you just said. We can see the gr- genuine gratefulness that you do have and your willingness to share with others is going to make a huge difference. So again, thank you for joining me today. It has been an honor. And if anyone listening has found that this helped them or they think of somebody else who could help, who this interview could help, please send it to them. Share the love. Share his his story because it truly is impactful and the more that we can learn from each other the greater this world will be so thank you so much you're welcome